Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Ask GN. As always, leave your questions in the comment section below if you want us to try and address them next video. Also, go ahead and upvote some of the questions that you like. That, as I've been learning with YouTube, it doesn't really seem to necessarily impact anything. Some of the questions with the most upvotes were further down in the thread, so I don't really understand how the comments here work, but we'll try it out anyway. Before getting to the questions, this content is brought to you by AMD and their RX 480 and 470 video cards in the Polaris product line. You can check out our reviews on both of those if you're curious for more or hit the link in the description below for sales on these cards. The first question is from Insight Show, who, uh, this is my rephrasing here, but the question was basically at a top level, how does hyperthreading impact, or how is it added to the chip? Is it a physical switch in the die or is it a microcode toggle of some kind? What's going on there to get hyperthreading on something like an i7-6700K as opposed to a non-hyperthreaded CPU from Intel? So. I do not know the answer to that. I reached out to Intel and sent it to them. It is a good question. Uh, they basically said, we will look into it and get back to you with all of the answers to your other architecture questions that you've asked this week. So uh, hopefully we'll have an answer soon. Intel is aware of the question. I'm thinking I'll get an answer right around when we get some more KB Lake information, just because it'll be all in one bundle that way. Uh, so that's on the table, that's, that's open for discussion, but I don't know the answer right now. My educated guess is that it's a microcode edition of some kind. That just makes more sense to me. I don't know if there's a validation reason, uh, or I, I don't think it's a physical toggle, but I could be wrong. So we'll, we'll wait for them to answer that. The same user asked, how does hyperthreading affect the lifespan as in working for new games without compromise of a CPU? How does it, for example, uh, in a 2600K compared to an i5-6600K. Those types of differences are going to be more through uh, architecture and IPC and things like that than threads necessarily, but um, specifically looking at the thread count and hyperthreading with older CPUs, we do see and have shown in the past some games like Metro Last Light, you see better 1% low and 0.1% low performance in the game uh, when benchmarking FPS because the extra threads do actually help, but it really is game dependent. So I would say things like uh, frequency generally, it depends how few cores you have, but once you kind of start hitting that four core range, frequency does have a, a bigger impact in general, a uh, big generalization, but generally a bigger impact on gameplay than more cores or more threads but uh, definitely extra threads helps in a few games. They're not that common. Battlefield 1 was not one of them. I thought maybe it would be, but it really wasn't. We benchmarked that. Metro Last Light's kind of an outlier. GTA 5 shows definitely some thread favorability depending on uh, how low you go on the CPU skew list, but still not a massive difference between i5s and i7s. It's kind of when you start getting lower than that that it makes a big difference in the, the low values. Does It does help with lifespan, of course, but uh, the gains, I think, are, are much more limited than other things like just overclocking your CPU. Next question, David Doulet, Doulet says, what do you think about the iGPU deal between Intel and AMD? As I understand it, that's not actually confirmed by anyone, uh, so I don't have any thoughts on it. <laughs> I think that's a rumor right now. Um, I think I talked about that on Joker's TGW show a week or two ago. And it was basically, at the time, was a rumor uh, that was popularized by Kyle Bennett of Hard OCP. Certainly been in the industry a while. He's got some credibility behind him, but he's still the source, the start and the end of the, of the statement. So I really have no thoughts or comments on it. Next question. I don't have this commenter's name written down, uh, but we'll go find it and put it in the normal place. Next question was basically about a Xeon versus an i7 and when it makes sense to buy one versus the other. Uh, so Xeon CPUs are kind of a hidden secret in system building if you're building enthusiast systems because you can often get them a bit cheaper than an i7 and they're mostly similar in some ways. Uh, so it's, it's a good way to save some money but you do sacrifice a bit. So uh, one example would be, well first of all, Xeons and i7s in the recent generations, as long as you're not going with some crazy uh, $5,000 CPU that really has some specific requirements for what it needs. The more equivalent to i7 Xeons will work on the mainstream motherboards and chipset platforms. Uh, so that makes them interesting as a, a buying option and to save some money or to 
to thwart stock issues. But the things you sacrifice, Xeon has no IGP, which is something that almost, I'm sure, all of you do not care about. Uh, so that's, that's one area where it's good. You lose the IGP. If you already are buying a DGPU, then who cares? You can use that die space for something more important, like in the case of the Xeon, higher cash. And more cash will help in production workloads and other specific applications, rendering applications, modeling, uh, stuff like that, simulation. That can help there. Not going to be a massive impact to games. What will impact games more is frequency, as kind of stated a second ago. Uh, and with frequency, the Xeons tend to be lower clocked and they're not really overclockable in the way that an i7 whatever would be, an i7 k skew 6700K for the current generation or something like that. So there's some sacrifices and some good. The good is maybe a bit cheaper. Uh, you can get more cash. You might get more cores, depending on which ones you're looking at. And that could be helpful if you're building a machine that will at least part-time double as a production system. Uh, you lose the frequency and you lose the overclocking, but if you care about neither of those, then I guess it's a good buy. But again, dropping frequency will impact gaming performance pretty reasonably. Oh, and the IGP, which is useless for the most part anyway, other than quick sync or something like that. Next question, Ricky Chan says, if AMD's Zen will flop, do you think that Intel will jack up their prices? I think Intel's prices are probably about where they will stay. Intel's way more worried about people like ARM and Qualcomm right now. I don't know that AMD has really posed that much of a threat in the last few years to Intel. Uh, certainly with Zen, they would pose more of a threat but I think Intel's a lot more worried about other competitors right now than in desktop where they're kind of, it's a smaller market, it's established, uh, and there's not a lot of innovation in it compared to things like mobile or server enterprise. So I think that's where their efforts are focused right now. But in terms of if, if Zen flops, I, I, don't, I don't really want to speculate that on that too much because I don't like speculating on how a product will perform before I even know how, uh, how it performs in terms of benchmarking. Uh, but you know, let's, let's say that Zen doesn't do great. I don't think it's going to change things a whole lot because the market's already pretty heavy on Intel right now. If you look at just the market share of Intel CPUs, the only thing, I, I only see this going in a direction of AMD gaining more market share or remaining the same. I don't know that they'll lose a whole lot. Uh, if they do, then there's other issues that we'll talk about at that point, but I don't, I don't think that's really uh, a main point of concern right now. So will they increase their prices? I would have to say probably not. If anything, they're going to stay the same, most likely stay the same, maybe go down a little bit if they're starting to feel some pressure from Zen, which would be a great thing, especially at the high end where you've got uh, Ryzen competing with the Broadwell chips, Broadwell E chips. Uh, that would be a good thing, but no, I, I think the answer to that is no. Next question is, Pixelist says, Dear GN, I overclocked my 6700K to 4.5 gigahertz with a 1.35 V core, and I start monitoring programs like CPU-Z. Voltage seems to go all the way up to 1.4 under load. That's not a huge fluctuation. When I use CPU-ID, it is constant at 1.6. Double-checked BIOS, and it's set to 1.35. Uh, yeah, so what you're seeing is it could be a few things without knowing your motherboard and other settings. Uh, there's a couple CPU settings in BIOS that you should check. Um, things like EIST and C states. And uh, there's a couple other OC settings, again, depending entirely on around a 6700K, so I guess we're probably on Z170. So you want to check C states and things like that. Generally, your voltage is going to look more variable depending on the software you're using to monitor it. So I would recommend something like ADA64 and uh, what's that other one? Hardware Info 64, I think. Both of those are, in my experience, pretty accurate with voltages. I would use those to monitor. Uh, CPU-Z should be accurate as well. But uh, Hardware Info 64 and ADA64 are the two I would get. And then it could be you're looking at different voltage values. CPUs have more than one voltage value, so make sure it is actually vCore for all the software you're using to validate 
because you may be looking at a different voltage value. Uh, and then the update frequency as well for the software could be different. So if you put two solutions next to each other, two programs on your desktop, you have CPU-Z here and then ADA64 and Hardware Info 64. If they're updating at different frequencies, which some of them you can tune, like ADA you can change and some you can't, if they update at different frequencies, then they might be three different numbers, even though they're all uh, presenting the data to you at the same time, they might have checked it at a different time, and so that would cause another disparity. But uh, the CPU will also, to some extent, change its voltage based on the current need. So uh, moving from 1.35 to 1.4, I would not say is a, is a huge deal. Uh, moving from 1.35 to 1.6 is a much bigger difference but I would start with checking the software. Next question, Smokey Dops says, what's your guys' take on FDM and 3D printers? I predict, uh, I predict a slide we see at the new Horizons event will include a red, black AMD branded bracket around the processor sample, and those would be 3D printed. I've no doubt an R&D company would be using 3D printers, but how about you? We don't use them. Um, I don't have one. <laughs> I, I have used them and I have, we did one video on 3D printers several years ago at a Maker Faire event. Uh, maybe one, maybe two, but I mean, they're cool. I don't really, I don't have a whole lot of thoughts on them, to be honest. We, we kind of focus on component. So that is out of my expertise. But I did want to bring it up because the point here that's interesting is the one about 3D printing brackets and things like that. That's something we've seen. It hasn't really taken off yet. And I'm trying to remember some of the other places we've seen that where companies have offered uh, semi-modular components. But that's, that's attempted to be a thing lately, especially with shrouds for different products, uh, brackets, stuff like that, GPU cooling solutions. I haven't really seen it take off though. Oh, uh, headsets as well. There's been a lot of headsets we've looked at lately at trade shows where they one of their big points is you could 3D print the external ear cup cover if you wanted a logo or something on it. But it doesn't, doesn't seem to have taken off in the enthusiast market just yet. Um, pretty cool, but definitely, uh, definitely out of my expertise. Last question is from whoever that guy is. He's returned. He's been out for at least 10 episodes now. Whoever this, that guy is, maybe uh, hopefully has improved since last time, says, Sup, Steve, it's been a while. Anyway, I installed this newest NVIDIA driver and it optimized all my neatly tuned graphics settings. How do I optimize your hair, hairstyle? That's it for this episode of Ask GN. As always, leave your questions in the comment section below and Patreon link to help us out directly. Subscribe for more content. We have a few interesting things coming up this week. It's going to be a bit of a lighter week at the end of it, holidays and all that, but uh, looking at hopefully and in when, I think it's the 805 Infinity, which we showed you all at Computex or CES or one of those shows. CES, I believe, a year, almost a year ago now. So looking at the 805 Infinity properly and we'll be looking at uh, some internal solutions that I've been building up for compressing our media and working with a NAS and stuff like that. So check back. As always, subscribe for more. I'll see you all next time.